All right, let's start working here. Um, so the basis of what we're going to spend today on is just how do we know which mechanism we go with and just get more practice. Right now we've got four mechanisms that we're dealing with, right? We've got two substitution mechanisms, first order and second order, and then we have two elimination mechanisms, first order and second order. Um, and we know sort of some of the ins and outs with all of our first order reactions, we have to worry about rearrangements. With our second order reactions, we have to worry about the sterics. Um, but deciding which of them, it's all well and good if I just say it's an E2. It's easy enough for everybody to, to figure out what's going on. Um, when I just say what happens if with this reaction, that's a little bit trickier because not only do you still have all the details of E2 to worry about if it's E2, you have to decide if it's E2 or E1 or SN1 or SN2. So that's what the bulk of what we have left to cover in this class is, is just going to be practice with that. Um, and again, just to get it on the recording, um, we only have this lecture, uh, one more Tuesday lecture, and that's when you'll start your lab final as well. I'll have your lab final assignment ready for you the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Um, like I mentioned, lab is just going to be another steam distillation followed by purifying. Um, or you could try the, the to do the um, the CO two extraction, but we'd actually have to put some numbers to it to get a percent yield. Um, but anyway, so that's that'll start on Tuesday when we get back from break. But Tuesday, the week we get back from break is week eleven, and then we have finals. So it's going to be real fast after Thanksgiving. So we only have one more lecture after this, and we may or may not even touch it. There's a I have a lecture prepped on. A bit more advanced ideas in NMR and peak splitting, explaining why sometimes the peak splitting is useful and sometimes it's not, and kind of you can dive into that further. I don't usually, so we'll probably spend that Tuesday doing practice problems um, and working on uh, on the uh, practice file. All right. So if we have uh, these two molecules here, let's look at, we'll take A first. What are the major and minor products of the following molecules when treated with a strong base? The key here, what does strong base tell us? Elimination. Elimination. With no more specifics, like it could also go through a substitution reactions, but without any more information, we don't know what the substitution products would be. We need to know what the nucleophile is for that to work, right? So if it just says strong base, just think pure elimination. So and strong base usually is going to mean uh, E2, the concerted mechanism. So no rearrangements to worry about. So let's look at A. Give that a second, and then we'll draw out the products. So how many products are there possible for A? Just two. Right, if you tried to draw a alkene bond that way, oops, and it started looking kind of funny, that's not going to work, right? The carbon with five bonds. The reason we can't see an elimination in that direction is because there's no hydrogen on that carbon. That quaternary carbon has no hydrogen that a base could pull off. So we won't see an elimination reaction. So we'll still see. Elimination to the other alpha carbon. And there's going to be a cis and a trans, right? So here's our trans. 
and there's our six. Right? Anything tricky really about that? For compared to what we've been talking about, that's pretty straightforward, right? The fact that there are two protons on this carbon is what allows us to have the cis and the trans, right? Which one would be the major product? The trans. Trans, just for sterics, right? If we did something like add a methyl group there, now all of a sudden that changes things. We're only going to get one product, right? Because we only have one hydrogen to work with. You can't make it cis or trans. We can't make it cis or trans. And we would also need to know what specific stereoisomer we started with. We started with this particular stereoisomer and the hydrogen in the back. We could look at it and remember that the hydrogen and the chlorine need to be in the same plane for the elimination to happen. So that they, they kind of are here already. So with this stereoisomer, we would get just the trans. If we started with the methyl back and hydrogen forward, we would get only the cis. We would need to rotate it so that the hydrogen was in the back again, opposite the chlorine. Oh, which is what we have over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with this in mind, when you have a carbon, when your alpha carbon has only one hydrogen, you need to arrange it so that hydrogen is opposite the chlorine before you can, and then you just basically flatten it out like putting flour in a, in a book, press it. All right, so we need to rotate this with the hydrogen back, which then gives us This molecule, for starters, the hydrogen is in the back, and the methyl is down over here. And now, when we pull the, the chlorine and the hydrogen off, they're roughly in the right, in the, the same plane. They're uh, periplanar. Sounds like a I, that I, that word bothers me. I, I dislike the yeah. mathematicians <laughs> by and like no, it can't be coplanar. They're periplanar. Very planar sounds like a 70s TV detective. Um, anyway, I'm just going to flatten this out. Probably worked wrong on airplanes, right? It's probably like a, <laughs> you're detected in the sky. Um, when we flatten this out, we'll get the trans. There. Accidentally put an extra. Methyl's in there. Methyl's go here. All right, and so this one you will only see one product. It's not a major and a minor like we saw with A. It's only this one. Even though this is the less favorable based on sterics, it's the one it has to be to get the hydrogen and chlorine very planar. Perry Mason, that's why I think Perry Planer. Perry Mason was a, was a lawyer and detective in the 70s TV show. I think he was a, he was a lawyer. Mathematicians just have to do whatever you think. No, it can be a degree off. It can't be coplanar. No proof to Say things, what are those? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so this is sort of, it's not the easiest summary to look at, but this is, I try to give you a bunch of different ways to look at these summaries of these. Um, but this is a pretty good idea of the relative reactivities. So if it's a methyl or it's a primary alkyl halide, if it's methyl, it can only do SN2. 
if there's only one carbon. You can't do an elimination reaction if there's only one carbon. But if it's primary alkyl halide, you can do SN2 or E2, depending on how good your leaving group is and how strong your base is. Is it a better base or is it a better uh, nucleophile? Tertiaries, alkyl halides, can go through E1 or E2, but they will never go through SN2. Right? And they, you can still do the second order elimination because the alpha carbons um, are still accessible. All right, and again, this, this is on the slides on Canvas, so you don't need to worry too much about writing all this down. I mean, we'll, we'll have some other ways of looking about this at this in a second. Um, and the key here, why all the similarities between the first order reactions and the second order reactions? Why are they similar? Because they have the same basic approach, right? First order means leaving group leaves and then something else happens. Second order reaction means everything's happening in a concerted manner. Right? And I've been I've been trying really hard not to use a one-step reaction versus two-step reaction because that makes the one and the two confusing. Yeah. First order and second order, I think concerted and stepwise, not one step, two step. I just want to put that out there. Don't get confused by the it really is one step or two step. Right. Exactly. So it's it's all about the first order versus the second order. And the first order reaction is stepwise, and the second order reaction is concerted. You can just think about it like with the reaction rates. Exactly. It's just going to be a lot faster. That exactly. E for SN2 versus. That's absolutely right. And that's, I'm glad that we, we set the table with Jen Cam in early on here to talk about it in those terms because this used to be the number one thing that my students in OCHEM would get confused on was they would mix up. The first order and the second order. It was like the, the OCHEM equivalent of um, thinking electrons have a positive charge. I lost the electron, my charge went down. Um, that's, a, that's a thing. If you know OCHEM, right? It, this is the same thing. The one and the two are confusing if you think about it in terms of number of steps. So don't do that. I find myself thinking like unimolecular, biomolecular. Yes. I'm trying to think back and remember it. I'm like, how many molecules are in that first step? And the, all the best online resources attack it that way too. Um, when I first learned OCHEM, there were no online resources, yeah. and um, and my my teacher had been teaching it since the seventies, and without updating the material a whole lot. Um, so we are better now about that. So pay attention to that. Um, what is the additional wrinkle that we have to do with for these first order reactions? Rearrangements. Rearrangements making it into a. Like a tertiary, right? So you can do a set hydride migration, or if you need to, you can also do a a um, uh, methyl migration. Those yeah. are slower, so they only happen if there's no hydrogen that can shift around. Um, We're not going to worry like migrations where there's like internal changes in yeah. ring size and stuff. For, for now, like just, just migrating, yeah. just hydrogen, hydrogen or methyl. If that's like bingo. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else is going to be more case by case specific. So I want you to be aware that it can happen, but it's not something you need to be looking out for. All right, so this is one of my favorite. This is from that Klein um, textbook um, that uh, where is no no longer our primary textbook because it's costs two hundred and eighty bucks. Um, so we use the Orlick Sachs one, but it still has some figures that I really, really like. And this is this is a really good summary slide. Um, and so this is key, and I will give you this on the time. I'm not going to give you the color graph here. You have to know how to apply it, but I'm going to give you this list of strong base, weak nucleophile, strong base, strong nucleophile, weak base, strong nucleophile, weak base, weak nucleophile. All right, and then um, for the or reactions, I know that this is not a comprehensive list and that there is some interplay here, but as far as for this for this um, class goes, your reaction sheet, your final is going to have basically a whole page or two page of reactions. It's going to be like 40 points um, of the 100 is going to be, I don't know if we get to quite that many yet, we still only have four mechanisms. Um, 
but basically that, that's where we're headed in OCHEM 2 is you, here's two pages of reactions. What's the major product for all of these reactions? Um, so just know that this is not comprehensive, but I'm only going to pull off of this for the test. Um, and so I might ask about some of the fringe cases in, in like an explain, explain why question. Um, but this is key, right? Basically, you won't see any E1 or SN1 if it's primary. So if you have a weak nucleophile, a weak base, you're not going to see much of any reaction on a primary or secondary alkyl halide. Base just because that leak, you can't have the leaving group leave first if it's sec if it's a primary carbon because that makes a primary carbocation super unstable. Secondary carbon. This is a little bit of a gray area. Sometimes we see. An SN2 can happen, especially if there's rearrangement possible. Um, and you will see some disagreement between different textbooks on this as well. You know, a lot of textbooks would have something in this box right here. Uh, but the key, so this is, I kind of like a, a more comprehensive look at it. And I need to. Do I get back to my mouse? <laughs> we're going to do, oh, we're going to do this. Or we're just going to Google it. No, that's not the right one. Hang on, I gotta get this link to work. We can do this. I change all my keyboard shortcuts sometimes, and then I'm never sure where I'm supposed to press the, to make it work. Why do you want to my keyboard shortcuts? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm old person when I do it. <laughs> Um, so the, the link that I gave you is actually the my Dropbox link for this because clearly it's not showing up as well when you just Google it. So if you yeah. go to the link that's in the PDF, um, it'll take you to a download link and you'll be able to get this. Um, all right, so I really like this approach to think about if you use this as your key for studying, when it comes to these competing mechanisms. If your substrate is primary, you will never see SN1. You will never see e E1. You will see SN2 with the strong nucleophile. You will see E2 with a strong bulky base or a strong base plus heat. We'll talk about the plus heat element. But base, that's one of the ways that you can differentiate between SN2 versus E2. If you keep it at a low temperature, you'll favor substitution more. If you raise it to a higher temperature, you see more elimination, right? And so you'll see that that's common for all of these, even for this, the um, SN or the SN1 versus E1, low temperature versus heat is key because you'll get both of them, but you can shift which one's the major product by controlling the temperature. That's an entropy thing, right? It's an entropy thing. Yeah, when you have an elimination reaction, um, Elimination reactions create additional molecules because you start with one molecule, with two molecules, and you wind up with, with more molecules as a result of pulling a hydrogen off and giving it to the base. And so you have more entropy for an elimination reaction. And so, and the entropy piece on delta G gets bigger when temperature goes up. High temperature favors increased entropy the side of the reaction with increased entropy. So at high temperatures, if you're choosing between substitution and elimination, look at the temperature is one of your go-to clues. Um, 
if you have a strong base in a tertiary alkyl halide, you can get E2 to happen, but you can also get SN1 or E1, right? So weak base, weak nucleophile, strong base, never. And then this also has the key, look out for rearrangements. Right? And specifically, this also has that, that reminder, your hydrogen and your leaving group must be periplanar and specifically anti-periplanar. So that they're pinpointed in opposite directions. Um, most of the time with elimination, we're looking at the Zeta set products, right? So this has a lot of keywords. This doesn't have everything you need to study, but if you can look at this cheat sheet and understand everything it says, like, oh, I know what that's talking about. I know what, how to do what that's talking about. This is sort of a good summary. Like if you can just go through and check, check, I know what that anti-periplanar means and when it applies. Check, I know um, rearrangements are involved, the resonance are involved, I know, and I know how to handle that. I can okay. check that off. So this is a good study guide when it comes to these. All right, and so, and you'll also notice that this has a slightly different I don't actually remember exactly which version of this particular um, list of nucleophiles and bases I put on the test, but you'll have a practice test on Monday, on Tuesday when we get back. And whatever's on the practice test is what I'll give you on the test itself. So study from that. When it, but it'll be something like this, where you've got strong, strong nucleophile, weak base, strong nucleophile, strong base, weak nucleophile, weak base, strong base, weak nucleophile. Um, and the key, and this this also has a good handy reference here. You, you mostly are going to see SN2 if it's a strong nucleophile weak base. If it's strong nucleophile and a strong base, you've got SN2 and E2. In the actual, the temperature is probably going to be your, your dividing line between those two. And if you can only do SN1 and E1, then we're looking at sterics and we're looking at making those carbocation intermediates and watching for rearrangements. And there's one case, if it's a strong base and a weak nucleophile, where you will only see E2. So that should be a, a relief. Mm -hmm. then there's at least one absolute in there. These big bulky bases, they're really strong bases and really weak nucleophiles. So those are the ones that you're, not only are you going to see only E2, you're going to get the Hoffman product instead of the Zaitsev product. You're going to get the less substituted uh, as your primary product, as your major product. All right, so we'll come back to this. One more question. Yeah. I want to make sure that I want to understand like the, the thiol being a strong nucleophile and a weak base. Or like the, mm -hmm. the why would that is it just because it's like a larger atom than oxygen and more polarizable that it doesn't act as strongly as a base like it's more stable by itself it's so it being not as electronegative yeah one of the ways you can think about it is it's got the same electron configuration almost as oxygen right. but oxygen being more electronegative is going to keep those electron cloud, clouds in tighter yeah it does. The thiol, the H2S, dihydrogen sulfide, um, and the thiol equivalent, which is this if you have a carbon attached to it. Um, because sulfur is not as electronegative, those and it's got electron, its valence electrons are in the n equals three level, those are larger electron clouds, which and they're more readily able to be shared. So it works better as a group for attacking than water does or an alcohol does because the oxygen is pulling those electrons in tighter. So even though the oxygen has more a stronger partial negative charge, it's less likely to share that partial negative charge. Does that make sense? So yeah, I've just have been having to beat this over and over again to get it into my head. The whole Basically, so sulfur is an exception. Most of your strong nucleophile weak bases and your strong nucleophile strong bases are going to have a negative charge. Yeah. For the most, the sulfur is about the only one that we consider a strong nucleophile that is not having a negative charge, and that's because it's got that those n equals three electrons. Cool. That helps. Yeah. Thank you. All right, 
as I mentioned, this is there's definitely a lot on this sheet. So there's, but it's all things we've covered with the exception of the last pieces that we were going to talk about is the, um, you know, sort of a flow chart decision making process or how do I decide which mechanism to look at. So this is going to be one of your test questions. So here's a molecule and here's a base slash nucleophile, strong base, strong nucleophile, draw all the possible products. So for all four mechanisms, even though we would look at this and say, well, normally it's not going to go through first order reaction. When I, when I say this, draw all elimination and substitution products, I mean all of them, take all four mechanisms. So there's going to be some duplicate, but the way that I would do this is I would say, okay, here's my E1 product. Here's my E2 product. Here's my SN1 product. Here's my SN2 product. Right? And just sort of, and if there's duplicates between them, that's fine. But that's the way I would divide up the way to think about this. So let's practice this. So we've got our four mechanisms. And I actually probably start, I've done the opposite order is the way I would just, I described. I would do the concerted reactions, the biomolecular reactions first, because they're going to have fewer products. Now, the nice thing about SN2 is it only will ever have one product. Just remember, it's got to be the backside attack. So bromide leaves, hydroxide comes in and attach, and the way you can keep track of that um, stereochemistry inversion is to keep everything in the same place. Just put your new group in the reverse position from your leaving group. So if your leaving group is into the board, your new, uh, your new group is out of the board. If your leaving group is out of the board, our new substituent is into the board. How about E2? It's still gonna be leaving group leaves, right? Except then now we have either our a proton transfer step from one of the two alpha carbons. We have two alpha carbons that have hydrogens. This alpha carbon only has a single hydrogen. We need to worry about cis and trans for either of these products. For the first one, right? Mm -hmm. This one, even though there's only one hydrogen on this alpha carbon, the fact that the two methyls are identical means we're not going to have to worry about cis or trans.
So the question doesn't specifically ask us to rank them in terms of major versus minor. We would see all three of these as products. Mm -hmm. Out of these E2 products, what would we expect to see as the major product? Probably the, the trans one. That one seems like it's the most substituted. It's only dye substituted, but it does have the limited sterics at least. Yeah. So out of these two, the trans is, is preferable. Zeit's rule. rule says, we want to make the most substitute. This one's tri substitute. This and this is a gray area because yeah. this one has resonance with the bed right. ring. So we'll definitely see that playing a role with the with the E1. Because when the when we get our leaving group leaves and leaves find a carbocation, we have to worry about that when it comes to um, a uh, hydrogen migration and getting a carbocation that has resonance. And this is what happens when I try to design one um, one problem that has everything in it, is that it has everything in it, which means you got to get a lot of these conflicting cases sometimes. But so either way, on the test, if I wrote, if I use this example and I asked you to choose between these three as which one's the major, if it's one of these gray area ones, as before, explain your logic and I can give you full credit because I would say just looking at it, my instinct is that this, the resonance is more important than Zaysev's role, but I don't expect you to have all that to intuition yet. I, like I've said, I've been doing this for years. Um, so if you said this one because of Zaysev's role, you're right. If you said this one because of resonance, you're also right. And this honestly is probably going to be one of those ones where it's like, you know, really close to the same amount of product for both of them, where you have those those um, conflicting variables. There's like a bajillion of the SN1 and the human protons. <laughs> yeah, let's, so with the, with the, the um, unimolecular reactions, uh, carbocation reactions, since they both are gonna come from the same intermediate, I would start by drawing the intermediate and showing any rearrangements and then and then diverge from there. So regardless of if it goes E1 or SN1, your first step is leaving group leaves, which leaves us here. Which means we have some, re some rearrangement that can happen, right? Move the positive over by moving the hydrogen. Yeah, if we have a hydrogen here, we drive that over. We get a carbon. In this, in this case, definitely better to have resonance than it is to have tertiary carbocation. Okay. Resonance is the more important thing here. So this is what I was talking about. I didn't mean to give you one where you had to choose between migration to make a tertiary carbocation or migration to give it resonance. But when in doubt, go with resonance is the more important variable for these. So then our actual intermediate that we're going to see all of our SN1 and E1 products is going to look like this. And that can participate in resonance. Because that gives, yes. We're not going to see the resonance, um, any of the resonance structures as part of the, as one of the products. Like we're not going to see our substitution, but it, but it, occurs. But it occurs and stabilizes it. All right, so then if we have hydroxide acting as a base, We're going to have it come in and attack that hydrogen. So we're going to actually get two of the same 
products from the E2, right? The two where the, the double bond was conjugated with the benzene ring. And just like before, we can pick which one's going to be the uh, primary product here based on the sterics in this case. So this is for E1, right? This is for E1. Yeah. Did I miss? I lost the header or a uh, metal one. And out of those, we go with the less sterically hindered. The bottom right is going to be the major out of these two. Last case for SN1 is we just have our hydroxide come in and attach directly. So we can have the um, the R and the S in this case. So because we're making a stereo center, we're going to get a mixture of both the R and the S because the hydroxide can attack from on top or underneath, and that'll just give us the only difference. So like on the test, if we just write R plus S like alongside it, it yeah, that'd be okay. Right. Okay. Right. So that was a lot of writing. I had to clear the board several times, right? So like half a page oh, worth of page. yeah. Um, but that's okay. Just give yourself enough space. Just to remind yourself as much as we like to limit waste. Paper is a renewable resource. Um, so don't don't worry about that too much on the test. Take take the space you need. Make it so that you can see what you did, and I can see what you did. All right. Any questions? That's a pretty good summary. It's a pretty good summary. And if we go back and look at so hydroxide is a strong base, strong nucleophile. We have a secondary alkyl halide. Secondary alkyl halide, strong base, strong nucleophile, going to mostly, it's going to be predominantly E2, SN2. And which of them is favored is going to be dependent a little bit on, on the temperature. So if you have either of these two, really, including this one, use your temperature as your dividing factor, as your, your determining factor. And so, I, and so on the test, I'll do things like in an ice bath or with heat. And the way that we show that on the reaction here um, is I'll either write ice bath if it's a low temperature, or I'll say low T, or just like heat. Heat, the symbol for heat is a delta, capital delta. Um, so if you see so that, that means addition of heat. Yeah. yeah. So at high temperature, you see. You're going to see predominantly the E2 in this case. At low temperature, you'll see predominantly the SN2. All right, and actually, that's the way that we have it set up in um, in the final here. Is that there's a page of reactions where it just says, "Tell me what the mechanism is. What's the favored mechanism?" Um, so that's effectively multiple choice, right? You've got four choices for each of them, and then it'll be the same five reactions on the second page or five or 10 reactions, I don't remember the number. It'll be the same reactions on the second page and it'll say, what's the major product of the mechanism you chose on the previous page?
So in the way that I the way that I grade that is I use I use the abbreviation wrong but consistent with. So if you if you picked E2 as the dominant mechanism and it should have been SN2, on the second page, I'm not going to mark you down twice for making that same mistake. So if you said E2, even though it should have been SN2, I'm still going to grade it like E2 was the right choice on the second page. So uh, it, it doesn't seem fair to me to mark you down twice for the same mistake, right? So as long as you can be consistent with your own logic, you're not going to be marked down. Because it always bothered me. I would have students that would say E2 and on one page, and then they would draw the product for substitution. I think they were like hedging their bets. Like, I'm not, it's a 50 50 shot, so I'm going to make sure I get at least one of these 100% right. Um, I, that bothers me because I'd rather you're internally consistent and logical the way you approach these. So that's why I use that wrong but consistent with your previous answers. Like that promoting intellectual honesty. <laughs> that's the idea. It doesn't always work out that way, but. <laughs> All right. So this is just going to be another way to think about um, the various aspects of this. Um, and so we'll go through these and we'll take a break and we'll go through them again and try to apply them. And then we just have some practice problems. Um, so we might actually finish a little bit early today. I'm sure everybody will be pretty upset about that on Thursday. Um, all right, so if we've got an alkyl K line, and this is putting aside the where what type of alkyl halide. So mostly this is talking about secondary alkyl halides because we know tertiary is always going to go first order, and we know primary is always second order. So when if we have a secondary alkyl halide, that's when we need to worry about these other factors. So if you've got a strong base at high concentration in a and an aprotic solvent. Concentration of the substrate or of the base? Yes. Because they both show up in your react in your rate law, right? Um, but more so the base and or the nucleophile, because if it's unimolecular, your rate looks like. I guess I'll just abbreviate alkyl halide as Rx. And that's just that's just for, for E1. That's for, for E1. Exactly, for both of them. The rate, the slow step is just leaving group leaves. So it's unimolecular. Yeah. If it's bimolecular rate or second order, your rate is going to be a different K value. Don't mix those up. Every reaction has its own, every mechanism has its own K value. But it's going to be concentration of Rx and concentration of your base or nucleophile. So increasing that has no effect on your first order reaction, but it does speed up your second order reaction. So you can, by increasing the concentration of your base slash nucleophile, you can actually get it to favor um, the biomolecular mechanisms. Because really, all four of these are happening all the time, just sometimes, in some cases, at too slow of a rate for us to measure. But they're still happening for the most part. Um, so strong bases or strong nucleophiles, high concentrations of your base slash nucleophile, aprotic solvents are going to make your bases stronger. And it also aprotic solvents aren't going to stabilize that well, that um, carbocation intermediate as much. Aprotic solvents, and the more polar a solvent, the better when it comes to stabilizing that intermediate. So weak bases, weak nucleophiles, lower concentrations of your nucleophiles, and in protic solvents are going to all favor the first order reactions. And then once you get, once you decide first order or second order, 
then you decide substitution or elimination, right? Because that's the bigger the bigger divide here is is it unimolecular or bimolecular? And then we look at it and say, okay, it's second order. Is it going to be elimination or substitution? All right, so this is this at least is the way that I divide up the logic in my head. Makes the most sense to me. Um, I like thinking in flow charts because it's just a series of yes/no questions, right? Um, if it's going, if you have something where you don't have any sterics getting in the way, it's going to favor substitution in both cases. Right, so if you have a small, hysterically small base slash nucleophile, um, if it's a less substituted carbon, so for bimolecular, if it's if it's a secondary alkyl halide, it's more likely to go substitution than elimination. If it's first order, we're never going to see first order um, for. For tertiary or for primary alkyl halides, so we're talking more about the tertiary versus secondary. I think I said it wrong here. This is we're talking about secondary versus primary, and also the size of the base itself. If there are steric hindrance, you're more likely to see the eliminations come out. The alpha carbon, you mean the like the primary carbon where the group is attached for the SN two and one? Not Sorry, yeah, I mean the active carbon. Okay. I just looked up and used our way okay. of uh, yeah, this active. Right. And so the sterics also, like I mentioned before, are one of the big reasons you can have a strong base weak nucleophile. Um, and I'm actually blanking on what TBU stands for. Um, but basically, if you have those, those big bulky groups attached to a nitrogen or a oxygen, so this one um, is lowercase, let me switch back. So T-butoxide, and this is DBN, I believe. Um, and again, I can't remember what it stands for, the abbreviations, but I'll look those up. They're in the textbook as well. Um, the main thing is you're just looking for those big bulky groups attached to something that would normally be a strong base, strong nucleophile. And really, the one that I use the most because it's the most commonly used, and we have it in the stock room, is um, lithium T, not lithium, T B O K, tert butyl potassium T butoxide is the real is the full name for it. But a lot of times, organic chemists will write it like this. The K is the potassium ion, so this is basically just deprotonated T butyl alcohol. Which it's going to look like that. So, a big bulky group attached to something that would normally be a strong base and a strong nucleophile makes it just a strong base. All right. So, this is the most common one that I use when I'm writing these tests, that it fits into this category right here strong base, weak nucleophile. And the other reason, the other factor with that is with these strong base weak nucleophiles, if they're they're pretty much always going to be sterically hindered, which means you don't get the Zaitsev product, you get the Hoffman product, you get the less substituted product um, with the with the T-butoxide because of the sterics.
All right, so let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 11 and we'll start by trying to apply some of these concepts and do some more practice with it.
it just needed to get skunky in here. Oh, um, you smell that? Okay, what? Skunky? I'm not the person to ask about smell stuff. <laughs> no, just me. So I think somebody might be right out there. So I'm getting just, just hints. All right. Regardless, bench. Um, it is tough. I don't hold it against anybody as long as you're not coming in the lab. Um, as I really don't. I like being able to treat my students like adults. They can make their own decisions, but I have to draw the line at coming into lab high um, yeah. because then it's a safety issue. But beyond that, you do you. <laughs> All right. If we're looking at this reaction here, is this going to, we can answer these questions kind of in either order. I would like to think first order, second order, first. Um, is this going to be first order or second order? Yeah, it can't be second order because it's, it at least can't be a second order um, substitution. It could be, especially with the resonance and a really good leaving. It's probably first order though, because not only do we have tertiary carbocations, the tertiary carbocation with resonance stabilization, those are all things. And in a non-polar solvent, um, that might change things a little bit in cyclohexane. But in general, we're thinking tertiary alkyl halide. Our simplest. We had to think about this was this one, tertiary alkyl halide, strong base, strong nucleophile, which is our, the amide is not listed on here, but it's a strong base, strong nucleophile. Um, so we're looking at E2. So not, we might be able to say if it was a weak base, we could say SN1, but in general, looking at it from the point of view of, think about the leaving group, think about how strong base and nucleophile you have. Strong base, strong nucleophile is always gonna favor uh, second order. And those are your two biggest variables, are how strong is your base slash nucleophile, and is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? Everything else is basically splitting hairs compared to those two. So if we're gonna favor elimination and second order, we're gonna favor second order because that's strong base, strong nucleophile. And we're gonna favor elimination because it's a tertiary, car a tertiary alkyl halide. So E2, and we have two alpha carbons. So what are our products that we could expect to see? We can have, plus the transversion, if we, if this is our alpha carbon, sorry, I'm missing one. I drew the arrow the wrong way. For that line. We have that plus the transversion. Or, This is the alpha carbon that loses the hydrogen. We're not going to have to worry about cis and trans, at least in this case. So out of those three, which is going to be favored? Or I guess, between the two colors, between the two alpha carbons, which will we see more of? 
Red or blue? Red. This is not a sterically hindered base, so we're going to see the more substituted carbon. Or sorry, more substituted alkene. This is tri-substituted, so is this. So we're going to see definitely more of the red alpha carbon going through this process. Then out of these, that's going to be a larger proportion. Again, also, just when it comes to if we, we're trying to rank these out again on the test, I'll try not to give you one where you're splitting hairs like this. Um, but if we're ranking these, it might be tricky because we might see 35% of the time it goes to the blue alpha carbon, which means 65% of the time it's going from the red alpha carbon. But then if the red alpha carbon Winds up with those being close to evenly split, you're doing like 55% of the 65%. So you might actually see the two percentages have to add up to 65%, which means they could both be lower than 35%. So your major product could actually be the blue one, even though the red alpha carbon is the more common. The, more favorable one. So if this was, um, you know, 40% of the time we get this and 25% of the time we get this and 35% of the time we get this, there is that we're, we have the larger chunk of the pie with the red ones, but we're splitting it in half again. So you can wind up with a plurality of products rather than a majority product. And here too, just with the first versus second order, first order also would not be a thing because the we're just not polar solvents of that carbon cation. It's not going to be very stabilized. Yeah. yeah. Um, and really, you should think that first order really only happens in the exceptions it, because it's such an unstable yeah. intermediate that you're making. So if we can do a second order reaction. Right. I mean, if we look here at this one, that's the only time first order comes off is when it's tertiary and when you have either weak base strong nucleophile or weak base weak nucleophile. Okay, that table, yeah, that's good. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but this is the best the summary of it. It's most of the time, think second order. It's just, is it going to be E2 or SN2? And if it absolutely can't do those, then you start looking at first order. Here's our T-butoxide. Is this going to favor elimination or substitution? Elimination. We have a strong base, but it's sterically hindered, so it can't be a strong nucleophile. So strong base, weak nucleophile, going to favor elimination, especially on a primary carbon. We're definitely not going to see any first order stuff going on. And with the sterically hindered base, we're not going to see much of the way up. We'll see probably some. In fact, the product that you would get if you did have this act as a, as a nucleophile is going to be a T-butyl ether. So this is not MTBE. This would be PTBE. Propyl terbutyl ether. Uh, but we used MTBE in lab on Tuesday, right? So we know that this, we can make this molecule. It's just not going to be the major product at the level we're learning it right now. Right now, we're going to say T butoxide, boom, elimination, done. But if you got that reaction really cold and left it alone for a year. Yeah, there's there are way other ways we can make we can make it a better if we might not go through a no, I guess we do. The number one, they call it the Williamson ether synthesis, is basically using a deprotonated alcohol as a nucleophile. Uh, and yeah, we do control it a lot with the temperature. Um, 
It won't be particularly strong in this case because we have that steric hindrance, but we'll get a measurable amount of it. And if we give it enough time and keep it a low temperature, we, then it, yeah, equilibrium will favor the ether over the elimination product. Um, is there any way to speed that up other than just like concentrations at that point when you're dealing with that really low temperature? Or? You could catalyze it. Okay. So catalysis lowers activation energy, right? That's the that's what it does. And so if you could go, but that's effectively going through a different mechanism if you catalyze it. Um, I have to I'd have to go back and look at the section on ethers to see if, what the other options are for making something with a sterically hindered base. Actually, what you know what you would do? You would start from um, T, T butyl chloride and have that be the target. Sense. For a different nucleus, you'd switch the nucleophile and the target. And then go through that would um, be like an SN1. And then it would go through SN1 because it's tertiary. Yeah. And then you can have, have your, oh, and then have propanol be your nucleophile instead of um, the team butoxide. That's how you do it. Now I remember. All right. As far as this part of the course goes, though. That is the SN2 product we would get, but we're saying don't, don't think of any SN2 products for this when you have a sterically hindered nucleophile. We're only going to see the elimination product. And there's only one of them. We don't even need to worry about Zaitsev versus Hoffman for this one either. And because it's a strong base, we would expect second order. Strong base and a primary ligand group. If we change it to a hydroxide, what does that give? Well, if we don't have a sterically hindered nucleophile, then all of a sudden we can start to see the substitution take over. If we have a primary alkyl halide that is a strong base and strong nucleophile, now we're up here. And now temperature is going to play a role. We're going to have some mixture of E2 versus SN2. Favoring the SN2, unless we say at high temperature. Right, and so that's where temperature comes into play is this piece right here. If we look at that last reaction and we look at all of the products, so it was if it goes through the substitution, we get the same number of pieces out the other side, right? But if it goes through elimination, we're going to get one, two, three independent pieces. So all eliminations all have that same, same thing. Substitution, because of the nature of it being substitution, means you're going to get the same number of pieces out the other side, which means they have effectively have delta S of zero within sig figs. On this side, though, the fact that we started from two independent particles and we made three independent particles meant we, means we have an increase of entropy that's fairly significant. Which means as the temperature goes up, that delta S piece gets bigger. We start favoring more and more, making the elimination product the higher and higher temperatures. Higher temperature doesn't really slow down the substitution. In fact, it's still at a higher temperature, so equilibrium or um, the rate law will still increase the way we would expect it to. But increasing the temperature means that the elimination is going to get favored even more. And because this is the equilibrium constant, not just the rate constant, at high temperatures, we favor the elimination product because that's more, it's for the same amount of exothermicity. 
um, for the same amount of delta H, we're going to get a more negative delta G at high temperatures. So bullet point here, high temperature favors elimination. If you're in one of those split boxes, um, and you can't decide, you've already decided first order versus second order, and you can't decide substitution versus elimination, temperature can be your, your, your final um, factor. And on the test, if you get to one where like, I think the temperature should be deciding this, but he doesn't say anything about temperature in the problem, you can always ask me. It's possible I forgot, I meant to put, you know, within an ice bath if I forgot to write it. Um, so you can always ask me, or I might just say, I think you have all the information you need, which is, you know, teacher speak or go look at the other variables again. Um, basically, it comes down like when you're deciding, like for uh, strong base, strong nucleophile, it kind of comes down to steric hindrance. If we're not talking about temperature, because if it's a primary, then SN2 will be more likely versus if it's secondary, there's more steric hindrance than the E2 will be. Right. Yeah. And the Zait Seb's rule of you get to make a more substituted alkene. Mm. The more substituted an alkene you can make, the more you're going to favor, delta G is going to favor that as well. Gotcha. So there's a couple of factors that go into it. It's the sterics and you're making a more stable product if it's a secondary alkyl halide. Just look at like the active and the alpha carbon. Right. Both are important. They both are important. Um, and that's that's why it's a sort of a sliding scale. Yeah. It's not a definitive, right. it will always be this. Yeah. Uh, we don't we don't do that in chemistry. <laughs> there's well, always this exception. That's why the physicists don't like chemists. <laughs> Because the chemists are always like, well, most of the time you're right, but Perry Planner. Right, Perry Planner. <laughs> all right, so if we have a secondary alkyl halide, that's really where all the, the trickiness comes in, right? If we're in a nonpolar or an aprotic solvent, And we have a strong base, strong nucleophile. This is the time when we would look at temperature would be a good fact because otherwise we're going to get some mixture of SN2 and E2. Because strong base, strong nucleophile on a secondary, with a secondary alkyl halide, that's squarely into our gray area. That's the, in the middle of that, that three by three box, right? Four by three. Um, and if you remember, that was a, it's going to be a mixture of E2SN2. Probably favoring E2, but that's definitely one where we said, and heat, then definitely E2. If we said in an ice bath, we'd say SN2. All right, so temperature is important but really use it as your last factor in terms of deciding between elimination and substitution. And if we had a weak base, weak nucleophile in a protic solvent, is that gonna favor what? So, secondary, weak nucleophile, weak base, SM1 or E1. We're not really going to see much of either of them. And this is this is the the two boxes that are that where this disagrees with our other color coded slide. A color color coded slide just said X. Right. Nothing. You're still going to get some, especially in a protic solvent where we could, where we have such a good leaving group with the protic solvent. Um, we'll still get some of both of them, but it'll probably be close to 50-50. And so again, temperature is going to be your defining factor. It'll be first order, but 
whether it goes first order substitution or first order elimination is going to be dependent on the temperature. Right. And it'll be slow either way. And so in the polar protic solvent, would it then like a secondary carbocation that is benzylacrylic be like more stable than a tertiary because of that resonance? Or is it kind of one of those? About the same. About the same? Okay. Yeah. This guy, I want to know that thing about the, the activation energy, I don't want to approach it that way too much. Mm -hmm. um, it won't be that different of an activation energy, but yeah. you're going to, you're still going to be able to favor making that a little bit more than if there's no resonance. So I, I actually typically put benzylic and allylic more down here, but the reason that they're here is because the re rearrangements and mm -hmm. these other things are closer, they react closer to secondary in most circumstances. Um, but with a weak base, weak nuclear value, you can get them to go second order. I would probably put them as their own category here. Yeah. Um, because there's their, they have their own wrinkles to pay attention to, right? All right, so in this case, if we said ice bath, polar protic, we're going to get alkene in the more substituted alkene. As our favored products here. Wait, the ice bath. Wouldn't that favor the? Uh, oh, sorry, that ice bath would favor eliminate. You're absolutely right. Yeah. 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 So with an ice bath, that's going to favor substitution. So we get a. Methyl sec butyl ether, if we're using the old school way of naming, which we won't for very much longer, just because we talked about MTBE. It's the only reason why we use that nomenclature um, when it comes to naming ethers. Um, the IUPAC way of naming ethers is way easier because you just treat them like they're a branch. Um, versus the old school way is you named each part separately. So the methyl sec butyl ether. It's weird. <laughs> Um, but then you have to know isopropyl versus secbutyl versus tert-butyl and all that stuff. My brain's already about to explode. <laughs> well, nomenclature is easy then, because that's that's like a step down in difficulty. It's right. Right. A little bit of vocabulary. <laughs> all. One more thing to think about right now. Yeah. Now we won't do nomenclature for for ethers yet, so don't stress about that. Cool, cool, cool. All right. We are at a good spot right now. We could start with about half an hour left, but I think we're, we're at a point where we could stop. So the last thing that we'll add in our last lecture, we might talk on NMR, do some NMR practice a little bit and add one more wrinkle to NMR. Um, but we'll probably talk about synthesis, which is basically just how do you go backward to say where you need to start from. Most of our reactions product has been, here's the reaction, what's the product? Mm -hmm. Synthesis is, here's the product you want. How do you get there? So it's just another way of thinking um, and problem solving. It's a little bit backwards. So we'll, we'll talk about that, though, on the Tuesday we get back from break. And then we'll have a review day on Thursday we get back from break. And we'll take a final on uh, Tuesday after that. I think we have Tuesday final. Does anybody remember what the schedule is? We'll talk about that when we come back. It doesn't matter for another <laughs> couple of weeks. So. I'm pretty sure it's usually Tuesday. I think so too. Um, we and we also have two time lab or two final time slots that we can use. So we have a little bit more flexibility because we have the lab time as well. Um, so we'll we'll talk about all the scheduling and everything. Uh, I also did get an email from the um, from the accommodation center. If anybody is looking to take their test, their final in the uh, accommodations 
um, services, uh, they would like if you would schedule it as soon as possible so that they know how many people they have to look forward to. But if you're just going to take it with me, then don't stress about that. All right. So for like a capstone question for like a thing in general, it would be like, here's a molecule.